Live streaming is on. Hey, good morning and good evening uh, to everyone, wherever you're coming from around the world. Thank you for joining us to a very exciting world from here. I'm very enthused to have a special guest with us who is a uh, leader in the banking industry. And uh, it, it dovetails in here nicely with all the things we've been talking about with DeFi, uh, with Uniswap and uh, open banking. And uh, today we're going to define what is open banking and uh, really get into the, the mix of how it's really going to change the landscape for businesses, for banks, and offer incredible services and solutions for consumers. But there are also some uh, issues that, that can, can crop up that people are worried about, uh, identity and protection of uh, information, et cetera. Uh, but before we get into that too deeply, uh, uh, good morning, Tim. We've got Tim Vasco, who's the CEO of Blockstrix Blockchain. As always, good to see you this morning, Tim. Good morning, Dan. <laughs> good morning, Tim. Yeah, always but, reminds me of always reminds me of that Robin Williams bit. Good I, morning, Vietnam. I know. I know. So good morning, world. Let's go. Love it. <laughs> always look forward to these mornings. And uh, Mr. Daniele Minci, who's the president of Fusion STX and Fusion Funder. Hey, good evening to you, Daniele, coming from uh, Italy. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me, as always. Yes, I always come from uh, the Eternal City. Yeah, I'm you still do. here. You do. <laughs> Would love to visit soon. Um, and then we we have uh, Mr. Mark Smedley, who has joined us, who is a uh, banking expert. And um, Mark, I know your background uh, includes uh, being in the C-suite at the uh, FDIC as well as uh, being an executive at uh, Oracle in the FinTech area. And uh, as you and I were just talking, you've uh, traveled all around the world and uh, just uh, very exciting what you've accomplished. And uh, now also Mark is a chief strategist in this uh, exciting sector. So uh, good to have you uh, on with us this morning here, Mark. Thank you, Dan, very much. And uh, Tim and Danielle, thank you very much for the invitation. Absolutely. So, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, we put on here cloud power to the people just because and just to kind of talk about this. If if you can remember the last time you did a mortgage and you had to spend two days digging through files, trying to find bank statements, trying to find all the information to then send via email and have information go back and forth. And then you're in the dark half the time. Um, there, There's a definite new solution and it's uh it's here right now and it's something we're working with uh in a couple of different areas and very exciting so we're uh, glad to have you and everybody on this call so tim well i i, I first want to open with how i met mark okay perfect <laughs> so, i met mark many years ago now and uh and the way i met him is mark was at oracle at the time um, I had a friend from MIT that that said, hey, Tim, called me up and he said, hey, Tim, we want to work with you at Oracle. And I said, no, you don't. Um, you're Oracle and we're entrepreneur. It's like it's like uh, oil and water. So um, <laughs> kept calling me, Sanjay, who's a good friend of Mar both Mark and mine. And, uh, and I said, look, I'm going to fly down there. I'm going to meet your boss. And he's going to kick me out in 10 minutes. And, and I did. I flew down there, went to the headquarters. Uh, Mark came in the room. I'm like, here we go. And got up on the whiteboard. And I said, this is where the world's headed. This is what we're doing. I know you're probably not interested. And Mark started going, actually, it's doing this and this and this and this and this. And the way Mark always says it, Ever since then, it started out a great relationship, a great friendship, a great journey. And I think it's poignant today to say we have been inside some of the biggest institutions on the planet trying to change mindsets for five years now, five years, all over the world, too. Um, we've had these discussions in Asia, in, in North America, coast to coast, all over. And... What Mark loves to say is, and within 10 minutes, not only didn't he kick me out of the room, we were completing each other's sentences. So <laughs> with that, Mark, thanks for joining us. It's been quite a journey. And you know what? I think the world's finally here. I agree with you, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, 
So if it's okay, I'm going to share a few thoughts around open banking and uh, DeFi, and then I'll turn it back to you. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right, great. So um, I, I'm a big believer in using language in very specific ways. So when we talk about open banking, um, there is there are two operative components to that concept. The first is banking. Those are the regulated banks. Uh, and the um, open banking initiative came out of Europe, out of the EU back in 2015 with a regulation that the European Parliament blessed called PSD2, Payment Services Direct Directive 2. Now, why is that important? Well, PSD2 mandated that all European institutions, including the UK at the time, open up a secure API layer to banking services, whether they were loans, deposits, wealth uh, management, investments, what have you, and to provide uh, customers with the ability to with the ability to consent to that access. In the earliest days, they were doing things like account inquiries, like what's your balance, um, or uh, things like personal financial planning. Flash forward six years, and the movement is caught on globally. Asia is doing a lot of really innovative things with the concept of open APIs. Regulators have published sort of reference guides and guidance around how to securely open APIs in a way that regulators will continue to bless. And the, um, uh, the biggest beneficiaries have really been third parties who are doing a tremendous amount of innovation in financial services, just as Blockcerts has done and will continue to do, um, with the banks really not catching, with, with, with notable exceptions, with banks really not catching on the innovative wave internally. Um, there's an interesting article published by Chris Skinner a couple of weeks ago um, stating that 70% of all innovation budget and spend in a large financial institution goes into the dustbin. So if you think about that, you have 70% of big bank budgets, and those are not small, um, you know, failing to create the kind of innovations that third-party fintechs cryptocurrency providers and others are are doing and have done. So the landscape is really interesting. I think banks want to innovate, but they need a lot of help, right? Which is where I think some of um, Blockcert's solutions come in. Um, it's also important to note that we live in a time of unprecedented monetary intervention. It's really important to understand this from a trust perspective. So the 2008 financial crisis globally um, resulted in a handful of really important megatrends. The first is that um, the U.S. economy is smaller than U.S. national debt. Okay, now think about that. Yeah. So the total GDP of the U.S. Um, is dwarfed by U.S. federal debt. So debt is 140 percent of GDP. Uh, before the COVID uh, bills have been passed. So you can see that, you know, there's a there's a fundamentally um, mi there's a fundamental mismatch between liquidity and um, monetary supply, money supply and the real economy. I'd argue that 2008 was the last time the real economy and the financial economy were actually connected. Really important to understand that because it impacts the banks, it impacts their thinking, it impacts how they spend. Um, the other outcome, two other outcomes from 2008, um, a gentleman named uh, Satoshi Nakamoto published the white paper Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer cash system in late 2008, which then gave rise to the entire cryptocurrency movement, not just Bitcoin. Now, why did that happen? Well, because trust, right? Trust and transparency in the banking system was very, very badly broken. Uh, trust scores in the banks hit a low of 44%, uh, restored now to about 57%. So trust is still being restored in, on the part of the banks, right? Um, people trust, consumers trust technology companies uh, far, far greater than they trust banks, although tech companies have taken a bit of a hit as well. But 75% of all consumers trust their tech companies, only 57% trust their banks. And that trend will be really interesting to watch going forward. Um, the, the current era of fintech disruption was born um, or accelerated, depending on when you you, you choose the uh, the start date. 
And importantly, China decided to disconnect from um, dependency on the U.S. Uh, financial system. There was a quote that I think the Minister of Finance made to um, Hank Paulson back in 2008, which goes something like, quote unquote, I thought you knew what you were doing. So, <laughs> right? Thanks. So the China... <laughs> So the Chinese state has ever since been determined to create its own financial system. You can see the outcomes in uh, recently they've issued their own uh, uh, crypto remnant. They've, um, uh, you know, created a uh, massive equity and bond uh, center in Shanghai. Uh, Hong Kong has been demoted quite a bit. That business is moving to Shanghai um, considerably. And importantly, um, you know, the Chinese uh, in mainland China, 70 percent of all Bitcoin mining is done in mainland China. It's a little known statistic. And the Chinese authorities have control over whether that will continue or not. So consider that when you, when you look at the Bitcoin boom um, and the dependency, there's always a dependency somewhere. And in this case, 70 percent of mining is done in mainland China. Right. Cheap energy. Um, if I can turn now just quickly to what I've seen in um, open banking and DeFi, you can see the two are beginning to confer converge just a bit. DeFi really means decentralized finance, right? So the question is, what role, if any, will banks play in the DeFi world? A couple of data points that are worth noting. One is that U.S. regulators and international regulators have begun to have begun to accept the notion that DeFi is here to stay. Uh, the cryptocurrency is here to stay. There was a um, announcement uh, the other day about um, Kraken, a, uh, a cryptocurrency exchange, just receiving a banking license in the state of Wyoming. Yeah. First one, first one ever to be followed by others. I think um, the FDIC, my alma mater worked in the chairman's office of the FDIC for three years, four years, um, hired a gentleman named Sultan Meiji, whom I know fairly well, as chief innovation officer of the FDIC, looking to figure out what to do with, with fintechs and cryptocurrency, et cetera. Um, and you can see the, uh, as Tim and, and, and Blockserts knows very well, Singapore has been sort of a leading uh, regulatory and monetary hub for innovation, all things fintech, crypto, and um, and uh, innovation and banking, uh, and I, I expect that will continue. Um, at this point, every bank has built their own API layer, secure API layer. Many are looking to monetize interoperability with third parties, but again, they need help. And uh, with you know innovative solutions like what BlockSearch is working on, I think the banks will respond incredibly favorably to taking cost out of the equation, whether it's in loan origination or any other area, and providing security, trust, transparency uh, in the process and, you know, removing the risk of uh, fraud, uh, hacking, um, cyber crime, et cetera, et cetera. As of last night, when I checked, the total market cap of the top 100, 100 um, DeFi tokens was worth $81 billion U.S. and growing. A month ago, it was 60 billion. So you can see the, you know, the, the, the fantastic sort of focus that uh, DeFi is attracting. Um, and even the uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank um, issued a white paper on the future of DeFi and is very favorable in their in their posture. So let me stop there. Those are some high level observations, Tim, and um, I'd be you know, very happy to continue or to take some questions. I can do a, a little bit more of a dive on DeFi if you like, but uh, let, me, well, let me stop actually, there. Actually, Mark, the time. Um, that's a really good uh, uh, point to jump into here. Um, and what I'd like to do is, you know, just talk a little bit about the reality of the journey we've, we've been through, um, touching on some of the points you made, because these are all statistics and facts. And that's what I love about Mark as he deals in statistics, he deals in facts and he deals in reality. And the reality is for years, we, we uh, together visited places like Singapore. Um, uh, I was in China right before COVID hit in uh, November, 2019, met Mark in Singapore at that same time. We've been through countless, like literally countless bank incubation centers 
And in 2017, we were telling bankers, stop, your accelerators are not going to work. They're, the whole world is an accelerator, a fintech accelerator. What are you doing being, you know, bringing these companies inside bank accelerators? I'm sure this is going to come as a big surprise to most people, Mark. Mm. Bankers aren't innovators. I, I know that that's a shocking statement. But <laughs> how many times did we go in and say, look, there's a bunch of really creative people out there. These are the fintech guys. Work with them. Open up your APIs. And, you know, the, the idea that this is now growing um, so rapidly, uh, I want to pick up a, a stat that you just did. So $80 billion is the market cap of DeFi. Um, there's a report by Allied Market Research that the open banking sector is $43 billion. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, this report was written, I don't know how exactly when it was written, but it's, it's going to reach $43 billion, I'm sorry, at a 24.4% CAGR um, by 2026. We're in 2021. And I believe this report was written before COVID. So think about that. We've already got a quasi banking sector opened up in DeFi that's more than double what the projection was if banks were sitting there um, and, and growing at a 24% rate at opening their APIs. Basically meaning that agility and speed are really the only two ways to adjust to this. In addition to that, I was reading in The Economist, um, there's an article right now, it just got published, I didn't finish it, about who's going to pay uh, America Inc. and who's going to pay for the $2 trillion um, uh, stimulus package of, of uh, Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. right? So what we're looking at, in, as you also point out, is this amazing pressure this amazing pressure on everything that we're familiar with to say we have to reshape our regulations. Not unlike what the Chinese uh, did, as you point out, in 2008, saying, wait a minute, this ain't going to work. Thought you knew what you were doing. Goodbye. Um, and, and today, what what's happening in China is this massive pressure on technology companies. Um, uh, another article out there, you can find it with, uh, where Tencent, um, $700 billion market cap, almost a trillion said, yeah, we need more regulations. That's the CEO, Paul Ma of, mm -hmm. <laughs> of Tencent. Well, he's got to say that, right? He he's wants to protect his moat. Yeah, he <laughs> has to say that. Um, and, and so when we look at this, we've been saying this, uh, for quite a while. And in uh, last year, April um, 2020, I published an article in Forbes called The Digital Trade War is Here. What we're talking about now is this merger of technology, money, and media. And we've been talking about it. You've just confirmed with all the facts. And this definition of what open banking is had just blown out of the water of where we were four or five years ago. Would you agree with that, Mark? Oh, absolutely. And I think the trend's going to accelerate. Um, I do too. You know, as you as you well know, Tim, you know, the fintech phenomenon in the last 10 years has been unbelievable. Um, but what's happening, I think, in broadly speaking, in the fintech and in DeFi is uh, a flight to quality, right? So, exactly. you know, lots of fintechs got funded uh, early on by seed angels, uh, you know, VCs. And a lot of those ideas were interesting, but they were duplicative and not not scalable, right? So the whole the flight to quality that you see in in DeFi, I think, is more around what's viable and what can be scaled and what can be monetized right. that benefits the consumer or the corporate participant. And you know the banks want to play; that's great, no problem. But it's happening without the banks more than it is as a dependency on the banks. Is that fair? Absolutely. And and I think that was kind of the lesson from our last multi-year yeah. journey, which is going into the banks and telling them, this is the way that things are going to be. 
Um, and this is how you get there was kind of like pushing an end of string and expecting it to punch a hole, right? It, it just, it was just very painful until now, until yeah. this moment in time where um, I, I got a story from one of the big bank vendors uh, that vends data into banks. And he said, when COVID hit last year, bankers were actually so disconnected from digital that they were hiring people to pick up PCs from their desks at work and bring them to their homes. Yeah. And the banks were struggling to yeah. even get their VPN to access it. So yeah. when you talk about the flight quality, I just want to break that down a little bit. Um, lots of fintechs out there, lots of really cool UIs and skinny app layers out there. Really, actually really brilliant ideas. But the problem is, as we've seen with, uh, even with um, like the uh, flash hack on Pancake on DeFi is there is this massive amount of layers of security and authentication. Uh, forget about regulation for a minute. Just the practical matters of standing these things up, as you know, Mark, probably better than anybody, is so incredibly difficult. And when we started way back with some of your partners in Europe, when you were with Oracle, the um, remember the API layers we started building back then and oh, standing yeah. up and so forth. We were trying to say, look, even if you got a great idea, even if you got the best idea in the world, you couldn't implement it <laughs> because of the infrastructure. Like the infrastructure typically in any, in any project, and we know this well at Boxer, is at least for enterprise uh, 18 months away. Mm -hmm. So if you can't do infrastructure as service as long, along with, what you call it be, right before we started? Um, yep. Mass. Uh, yep. um, mortgage. Um, yeah, M mortgage as a service. If you can't deliver that that infrastructure along with innovation, you you can't implement. Not in not in the financial services sector. Would you agree? Yeah, it's with not that? just like an Apple app where you can plug it in. You don't have to worry about anything when you're talking about your personal information, your bank. Uh, all of your financial information, I, I, that that's a whole different deal than uh, downloading a song. But I, but I think yeah. it's a, it's like, uh, you know, I've, I've been always struggling uh, to understand what open finance and open banking was, because essentially trying to build an open system on a closed system, it's kind of a clash for me. So when I make a comparison on what open banking is versus DeFi, because I heard many times saying that DeFi is an evolution of open banking. To me, it's not. No, because I agree. DeFi, DeFi starts as an open system at the foundation because mm -hmm. the code, it's an open source, you know? While the open banking, it's trying APIs on a closed system. You need to ask for permission. On, uh, on DeFi, you can build on top of a protocol, which is an open oh, source. Yeah, the way, I, the way I'd, I'd synthesize that quickly, Danielle, is uh, open banking requires a bank. It's a bank regulation. It's a bank initiative, right? DeFi yeah. is not. Um, so with, with DeFi, banks are optional, in some cases welcome. I think there are use cases that would be really interesting to work with the banks on. Um, but open banking as a category has been... Um, not as successful, right? Because the banks, to your point, are rigid and uh, costly and slow and all the other things that Tim mentioned. Um, whereas the DeFi world is nimble, agile, um, you know, quickly scalable and uh, solves real world problems without necessarily requiring a bank intermediary. It's a, it's a different world, right? The two could be complementary in some cases, but they're yeah. not. Um, they're not uh, necessarily mutually dependent. And and yeah, let me just yeah. point. Ask you guys both. Isn't that the bridge? Isn't that the bridge that we really need? <clears throat> need is this <clears throat> concept of banking as a service. Chris Skinner, as you point out, talks a lot about that. Mark and mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity, thanks to you, to meet Chris. Um, we met him in New York. Uh, several years ago and um and the uh 
you know, isn't that the crux of it is as we build these tools and this agility, the bridge between transforming the banking industry as well as bringing in this um, permissionless system into a framework is really where we're going to see a tremendous amount of uh, growth and, and, and effectiveness. Agreed. And I, I'd add one more thing, Tim, which is, you know, the, the platform that you've built uh, and continue to evolve uh, becomes really important so that you're not just you're not just vending a widget. You're, you're really creating a platform that has many dimensions and many use cases, which I applaud you for. And I think Thank that's you. going to have that's going to serve you incredibly well over time. It's going to serve your customers and your investors. Thank you. Well, I think that one of the other things I want to point out, and Daniele, you can speak to this because Mark said the same thing you've been saying in many, many ways, where he said, look, Bitcoin is not um, distributed, first of all. It's, it, it's consolidated and it's constrained within China. All of this processing power is within China. Um, from a technology standpoint, I've always found that interesting about the proof of work concept. Proof of work in and of itself is not a bad protocol to get um, blocks built and, and authenticity. What's bad about the proof of work uh, or what the first evolution, I'll say it that way, is of proof of work was you had to run all this compute power in a centralized format to get any economics out of it. It was the only way to actually create Bitcoin and it was the only way really to create rewards of any scale out of Ethereum. As soon as you can break that up, which is what we've engineered, uh, to your point, Mark, every app, every device, everything that we deal with is a, uh, is a, has compute power. Everything does. So I can literally, if I'm running a transaction here, do proof of work. And it's actually the most distributed you can possibly be is to get it down to that level. So I'd like you guys to talk a little bit about that because I don't think I get it technically what it means to put a node up or to run an application that's doing a compute and then and then creates that block. But I don't think I, I think you could really make some impact as to what that means when you say consolidated, because again, open source or DeFi versus banks or consolidated kind of mining operations. Yeah, but that too, I would say uh, I can, you know, just to follow up your, you know, open uh, open statement, not a question. Uh, there are two points I think it makes sense to mention. Number one, uh, there is a reaccumulation of Bitcoin uh, that is moving out from China. It is true that, you know, mining power, it's concentrated in China, but due to halving, less and less Bitcoins are being minted on ongoing basis. Yeah, so, yeah. and what you see right now in the graphs of the whales, so the whales worldwide, right now, these hours, they are accumulating again. In the previous weeks, uh, there was beginning of March and also in January, there was a price correction following dumps by whales, mostly Chinese, that dumps their coins. So they sold because the price was very high. You know, they took profits out of it. And there was a reaccumulation phase we don't know where. You know, mm. market intelligence is telling us that US, US as a whole, US institutional, US exchanges, US, you know, whales have an interest to hold for a long period of time uh, Bitcoin. Step number one. And step number two, probably you heard David O'Leary talking about blood coins. So the coins mined in China, as he said. So he said he wants to buy coins mined with clean energy. So there will be kind of an industrial shift that is uh, heavily investing into mining companies that producing clean Bitcoin in uh, in different part of the world, out of China, mm -hmm. China mine land. And this is a topic that is very hot at the moment. That's with regard to your first point. About the second point, Tim, I think we will be a massive shift while uh, Ethereum V2 will launch their proof of stake. So from the shift from proof of work to proof of stake and seeing a, a much more active participation in staking those uh, 32 Ethereum 
in the network and participating with the stake of the network with the tokens instead of with the proof of work with uh, you know computing power it would be very interesting to see you know the analytics so the practical difference on how proof of work works versus proof of stake at the same time in the same uh, period of time we don't have any metric because today ethereum is still on proof of work but i think we we'll start seeing something visible by the launch of uh, v2 probably beginning of next year yeah and and v3 and uniswap in uh, may as well and the launch of uniswap of uh, uniswap v3 may the 5th it will be a massive massive catalyst for the industry because we will see a complete new price discovery mechanism within a decentralized exchange something we never experienced into uh into crypto as a as a whole and right. how liquidity and concentrated liquidity is being managed so it would be very interesting to see how these events how these big events will play uh into the industry yeah so with regard to that mark uh what are your thoughts on that and then i'd like to take us into um what the uk did i think at the beginning of this year you'll know better about um enforcing open banking regulations so yeah so thanks tim so um just observation on what uh danielle just said uh there's a new not new but there's a renewed focus on green finance if you if you take the category the esg category and um you know responsible finance executives and regulators are really pushing to um make sure that financial entities are focused on helping to solve the climate change problem um interesting just one more interesting um statistic uh bitcoin mining consumes more energy than sweden okay so you know not the greenest not the greenest model in the world as it turns out right um and then yeah you know in, in the uk right the uk is an interesting animal at the moment um they disconnected of course from the eu even during the psd2 uh, early days that they they decided to do things a little bit differently and the influence that the uk uh has has impacted um i think positively australia new zealand you know other commonwealth countries um and because they see they see open banking um as they've defined as the uk's regulators have defined it as a way forward uh that differentiates the uk institutions and uk innovation and of course london's a huge center of financial innovation and fintechs um you know beyond that it's going to be interesting to watch because the uk also has a number of problems to solve not the least of which is you know rioting on the streets of belfast again right as a result of brexit and the hard border so you know the political risk uh that the uk faces post brexit is still not incredibly uh clear the path isn't clear but institutions uh based in london um are definitely looking to uh innovate quicker and to ta to take advantage of what the banks already have uh i spoke with the ex cio of hsbc not too long ago and you know you can imagine the the, the large large you know pool of uh technologies applications systems that need to be rationalized the question really is you know how can uh the uk institutions capitalize upon the innovation that's happening right in london right so you know those are some thoughts so with that um daniele what are your thoughts about europe and the eu and the uk because you've spent a huge amount of time there in yeah. in the uh environment um working both uh directly within the sector um and and uh you know the regulations are quite interesting in in the uk as well because they're much more bespoke and uh and specific to a lot of the um fintech as well as uh banking um environments so maybe you can give us a read on it yeah i mean there are regulations um that have approached so they have moved a little bit faster than others you know in the whole europe uh for example germany has taken active steps to to partially regulate the industry not the industry of the virtual assets but at mm -hmm. least starting to define um uh 
a portion of the tokenized assets and uh, and the exchange uh, industry as a whole. Uh, I mean, if you take uh, uh, Europe as a whole, okay. So step number one, uh, and I think uh, no one it's it's fully up to speed right now. I think the Coinbase listing that is going to happen on the 14th of April, it will be a massive event for the whole industry of the virtual asset exchanges or, or the digital assets platform, so to say, mm. because you know uh, uh, Coinbase will be listed by the Nasdaq with a monster valuation of 100 billion, and uh, it will define a new way of doing things. And I think regulation will start to craft uh, uh, new models out of Coinbase and the others will follow. For example, right. taxation. So Coinbase is one of the first, if not the first exchange in the world that has implemented uh, a model to extract uh, the forms for your tax authority automatically, instead of you managing in an Excel spreadsheet, all the profits you've taken out of the thousands of trades you have done, and then to submit to your tax agency and they will not understand anything out of it. So this regulation or taxation and uh, and the, the approach to regulation, it's completely missing as a whole. So I believe Coinbase listing will help, uh, but at the end of the day, regulation right now, and I give you the example of the, re the, the, the regulator I know the most, so which is UK, Switzerland and Italy, they're still trying to define, you know, Bitcoin and all the other assets as the currency, but they are not currencies. They are mm -hmm. not. They don't configure themselves as a currency. They are assets. Technically, they are alternative assets. So, the moment regulator will flip the mindset of considering them as a beside the stable coin, as digital assets, as alternative assets, and trying to think a tailored regulation for these uh, specific assets. We will see a tremendous improvement mm -hmm. as a whole all over the world. I and I and I believe the leading, so the thought leader in the space is the US. Beside, you know, other jurisdiction uh, have made uh, steps ahead and they have done active steps. Singapore is one, for example. Right. But I think so. US has a, such a tremendous interest for the whole financial community. If nothing happens there, nothing really serious happens elsewhere. In my humble views. So that's why I'm very anxious to see what's going to happen post, you know, Coinbase listing, because there will be a tremendous shift to give acceleration to the whole regulation uh, space. Well, and, it, and I think yeah. that with um, Mark, maybe you can comment on that because your whole experience is, is, is in the US and starting with uh, regulators, like how are the regulators gonna view this and so forth? I know, um, in Canada, the regulators are very slow to act. Um, they'll follow, they will never leave. <laughs> um, and so what do you think is going to happen in, in the United States? Oh, I think you're muted, Mark. Yeah, I was saying, Tim, if I knew that, I would, uh, I'd be on the beach somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you, have um, <laughs> you can bet on I prediction do... markets. Yeah, you were on a beach in Singapore. You came back. Yeah, well, you know, COVID had something to do with that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so, so I'll give you some observations. So, uh, data points are moving in the right direction. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the regulatory developments. Uh, to Danielle's point, uh, when Wyoming approved uh, Kraken as the first sort of crypto bank, they classified uh, cryptocurrency as an asset class, not as a coin, not as a currency, right? right. And, yeah. uh, and and also created its own chancery court and uh, put the asset class under uniform commercial code law in the United States, which makes it very easy for investors and uh, market participants to understand. So that's a yeah. that's a huge that, that's a massive development, I think. Um, because it as is. you know, as you know, as you guys all know, and it blocks certs, um, there's been this back and forth in the regulators about is it a currency, is it is an asset, what is it exactly? Well, Wyoming has just defined it. So that right. to me looks like a foundation stone. Um, I've got to check in with uh, the FDIC on this, but I would imagine that they are looking at this very favorably because it solves a big problem about what to do with crypto, right? If it's an asset class, 
it looks totally different than a currency or um, you know a speculative um, uh, you know crypto, which people have really a great deal of trouble defining. Um, if I were to put a crystal ball out, I'd say that um, DeFi and crypto are here to stay. I think there will be regulation. I think the regulation will be less than that of the incumbent banks. Um, I think Chris Skinner put out a table a couple of days ago on LinkedIn comparing, you know, sort of bank regulatory burden with non-bank financial and DeFi uh, regulatory burdens as of today globally. You know, interesting to watch, um, but overregulation is not, I think, a good idea for either the regulators or the economy as a whole or for the categories. Um, so I think the regulators are looking to, to approach this with a uh, lighter touch than what they've done with the big banks, but, you know, to be determined. And I think the big wild card is, will the banks participate or will they stay on the sidelines? You can see JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley and Gold and some of the others have jumped into crypto yeah. one way or another, but many have, have decided not to and um, have banned Bitcoin. So. You know, I, I think we're looking at the early stages of an evolution that's that's going to result in a paradigm shift of regulation and, um, you know, and, and DeFi and how financial services are delivered. But I give a suggestion. The context or outside. Yeah, I give a suggestion, uh, Mark. Tell me whether you agree or not. So in the world, I mean, if I take U.S. as a projection, so in the US, if I'm not mistaken, there are 3 trillion US dollars worth of cash, physical cash, and 50 something trillion in, uh, in loans, approximately, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the vast majority, obviously, is electronic money, is not physical money, obviously. Right, right. The suggestion I give to regulator is uh, to encourage the conversion from cash to crypto, to digital assets, because it's more traceable first and foremost and uh, and uh, the moment you you move cash to digital assets as a whole so you have also a tax incentive because once you deal with cash you have to declare the cash you have assuming you do it and then you have to pay taxes on it in italy is 0.03 percent of the cash you have you have to declare it and you have to pay taxes as a currency so, mm -hmm. but if it's not cash, if it's a digital asset and you don't take any profit because you don't sell it, you don't realize a profit out of it, perhaps you have to pay nothing. So you have an advantage in holding um, digital assets as opposite to cash. Mm -hmm. That would be for me a good way to encourage, you know, on ramp into the system. And that's because once you're there, then you will see you have advantages, DeFi and all the rest. And then you can yeah. you can start understanding how it works, and regulators will have a benefit because they will have more people in there, and they can start getting traction for the newborn regulations they can build on top. And cash yeah, then it, is into the system, creating velocity, which then obviously is the economy. So what I, what I what I'm hearing you guys say, and actually from experience, I think I'm hearing you say this, but I agree, is that where the regulations lead, we've got Wyoming now, we've got Coinbase in the United States, we've got some really positive regulatory moves in, in the UK. Um, this, is, this is a huge benefit for those economies, is it not? I mean, literally, this is where the, the, the effort and the innovation and the flow is gonna flow into these places it's gonna be a giant sucking sound for the rest of the world and banks for that matter and and kind of centralized authorities that that they're gonna wake up one day and say what happened well you know you you kind of stood still while the rocket ship was leaving i'm uh what what do you think about that guys is, is, well, i think I, it's uh there would be that's what i'm hearing yeah i think there would be in a, in a, to go to a deeper level of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, to, to an example, I would say there will be, in what you're, you're just saying, we will see a massive shift by the time bank will issue loans right. with a collateral in Bitcoin. Right. 
and and locational or geographical because most regulations are locational and geographical how is that going to be affected mark you know it's it, i take a step back for a second and sort of just observe <laughs> that uh u.s federal reserve is unique in two ways one is that it's a private public uh organization right it's a it's a quasi-governmental mm -hmm. organization owned by you know the banks the banking system um and it also is the you know custodian and manager of the world's reserve currency right so unique mm -hmm. among unique among regulators in that sense so i think the wild card really tim is what will the federal reserve decide to do vis-a-vis -vis cryptocurrency will they issue a crypto dollar that's been discussed uh, right. mit has collaborated with the boston fed on this for a number of years um will they uh insist upon retaining the existing bank uh based system of managing the money supply and to danielle's point you know every time a bank makes a loan there's money created right that that expands the money supply in an odd sort of perverse yep. way so debt is actually money when you look at the debits and credits um will the uh crypto and DeFi world begin to supplant how the fed and the U.S. government thinks about managing the money supply and the relevance to the U.S. as a reserve, reserve currency going forward. Now, those are mega, mega issues that I can't really get my head around in terms of what's likely to happen. But to your point, it's happening anyway, right? And right, as, yeah. as the markets right. mature and as momentum is gained, I don't think the Fed or any of the regulators can stand by and do nothing because the risk of doing nothing is now becoming uh, higher than doing something. Exactly. So now we see, we see sort of federal and state uh, banking commissions beginning to engage the way that I've seen Singapore engage in the past, right? And the Chinese, yes. right? Which is, which is to cultivate appropriate, responsible innovation um, and to begin to understand how it can be regulated, taxed, and, and uh, managed appropriately going forward. I think that's where we're at the beginning right. of that stage, I think. Yeah, so, so I want yeah, to, to, to the point, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. to the point, uh, Tim, t you made a point, uh, you know, you asked me before what's going on in Europe as opposite to the rest of the world on, you know, what's there. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, you know, from Europe, I do see that the whole, you know, the whole economic world, is moving because of the boost that the us is providing right mm -hmm. now because us is, is is taking active steps into the space to reboost the i'm talking about the whole economy and this has always been uh, like like this in the in the last years so obviously you know the digital assets uh, uh bitcoin or whatever should have a kind of a touch point to the real economy somehow otherwise it stays disconnected and we cannot live as a whole with passive incomes, with the Bitcoin price that goes up in value, if the wealth is not being distributed and is being spread across the, the true economy, you know. Right. So that's why this layer, in my view, is the layer that it's kind of missing into this digital asset space, which is growing, but it's still a relatively small industry. Right now, the market cap is about two trillion, about a right. little bit less. So, what I believe. And I'm very, you know, uh, I'm, I'm positively looking at what is going on in the U.S. Is that the, there is a, the U.S. you know government? I'm taking as a whole uh, has a no option just to observe, as opposite to what happens in Europe. In Europe, there is a, a little bit more conservative approach here, just waiting what happens in the U.S. and right. eventually takes right. other steps. So. That's why I'm much more, I encourage much more what's going on in the U.S. as opposite to what's going on in Europe at the moment. Okay. Well, guys, we're running out of time, but I just want to leave you with this because there's so much we could keep going on. Um, but the, uh, the one thought that I would like you guys to think about, because we're going to bring this back. I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions and so forth, is one thought is this. Will there be a new type a new, more innovative way for governments and regulators to get involved in regulating. Um, we saw the evolution of WMF, the World Monetary Fund. Uh, we all, all, everybody, all, everybody all knows what the WHO is now, of course. Um, and, and so thinking about that and removing this into a more 
innovative and directed regulatory schema that is both global as, as well as aware of what it takes uh, both from a technology and asset and currency standpoint, what I'm hearing is there needs to be innovative thought leadership with these governments to create a, a better regulatory schema. But with that cliffhanger, we'll leave it there. Um, we're out of time and I can't thank you guys enough for being here, Mark. Always a pleasure. The uh, and uh, brilliance is, is overwhelming when when I hear you talk about things and, and I always enjoy it. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us today on the world thank premiere you. at Boxers. Thank and, you. Uh, Dan? Yeah, yeah. well, and I was gonna say uh, part two would be, we've talked very high level here, but I think part two would be to dig down into applications and what does that really yeah. mean for a consumer? What does that really mean for a business? Because open banking, there definitely are benefits to banks. You know, obviously- a Onboarding small, smart contracts, you name it. Yeah, all yeah, good, mortgages, uh, all that kind of stuff. And right. I think that would be a, a good next step for next week. Okay. So, yeah, with that, uh, if you like what you heard, uh, click uh, on the thumbs up button and uh, subscribe to our channel. We definitely appreciate that. We'll Dude, be back here. Works. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we love uh, thumbs up in the, the chat there as well. But uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. And if you're interested to learn more about what we're doing here at BlockCerts, just go to BlockCerts.com. And uh, we've got a wealth of information there. And we're uh, definitely square into the space and uh, uh, very enthused to be involved with such a growing uh, place where uh, so many things are happening and it's benefiting businesses and consumers both. So thank you very much for joining us. And thank Tim, you, like you always say. And uh, stay safe, stay healthy, especially stay healthy now. We've got that third wave going and we want to get through this and, and open your banking to digital. Stay digital, get digital. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.